welcome to What's New in Medical Simulation. Um, if you're in medical education, you may know that the, Amer the Association of Amer American Medical Colleges, the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine, and the Accreditation Council of Graduate Medical Education are working together to create a set of foundational competencies for undergraduate medical education programs in the U.S. Due to be released in early 2024, these medical school competencies will aim to improve the transition to residency. To help inform the development of the foundational competencies, members of the medical education community have contributed um, to the essential skills that they help will uh, ease the transition to residency. Today, during our webinar, we will highlight three solutions that will help support your medical students in an impactful way. First, the Next Generation Harvey, the cardiopulmonary patient simulator, realistically simulates almost any cardiac disease at the touch of a button by varying blood pressure, pulses, heart sounds, murmurs, and breath sounds. For more than 50 years, Harvey has been a proven simulation system to teach bedside cardiac assessment skills that transfer to real patients. During today's webinar, you'll hear about some of the new features added to increase training experiences further, including new patient scenarios, enhanced physical exams, and the UMedic curriculum. Next, you'll hear about Sim Capture, a simulation management solution that brings it all together. Everything you need to plan, schedule, operate, evaluate, and scale your simulation program. This comprehensive tool has been providing video and data-driven insights to clients since 2005. During today's showcase, you'll hear about ways to leverage new training strategies and increase efficiencies at every stage of medical education with Sim Capture. Finally, we'll dive into SimX. In June 2023, Lairdall announced a partnership with SimX, a leader in virtual reality medical simulation training to widen the impact of VR and helping prepare healthcare providers to deliver high quality care. Developed by clinicians or clinicians and educators, SimX emerges learners in a unique Holden Lock-like experience that allows them to treat patients the same way they do in real life. During today's presentation, you'll hear how SimX can help increase clinical preparedness and patient safety with their VR simulation training. We're so pleased to have three subject matter experts join us today. We have Dr. Ross Scalise, Errol Gardner, and Dr. Ryan Rivera. So I will now turn it over to Dr. Scalise to talk about Harvey. Dr. Scalise, you're on mute. Thank you so much. And just sharing screen. Are we good there with full screen? All right. Yes, we can. So, see really it. a pleasure to be with everyone. Thanks so much to our hosts at Lairdall Medical. Um, my name is Ross Scalise, and I'm here at the University of Miami Gordon Center. Uh, here at the medical school, I'm professor of medicine. My clinical background is in general internal medicine. Um, so, that's the uh, fellow of the American College of Physicians part. I'm also a fellow of the Society for Simulation and Healthcare. And my specific role here at the Gordon Center is Director of Educational Technology Development. So a little bit of a disclaimer, I'm full-time faculty at the University of Miami. Uh, so you can consider me more of a super user of Harvey. Uh, I don't get any commissions uh, for, for selling Harvey's. Um, our center is named for Dr. Michael Gordon, who some of you may have known um, in the past through his involvement, uh, really as one of the, the founding folks of the Simulation Society. He was honored as a, with the Society's Pioneer in Simulation Award uh, back in 2015. Um, Dr. Gordon, many people know him as the inventor of Harvey and really a pioneer in computer-enhanced simulation. But people may not realize that he was also really a, generally a medical education expert and visionary and developed some of the first e-learning programs um, in health professions education that I'm going to also talk about later. And although we're going to feature a lot of different technology solutions here, um, this is a, a product showcase after all, um, Dr. Gordon always used to remind us about our mission statement here at the Gordon Center, which I've shown there, saving lives through simulation technology. So you know, simulation or e-learning, VR, they're all just tools um, by which we hope to improve the education that we offer uh, to our learners. And we hope that those we train um, will take better care of patients. So it's really all about the saving lives part. And that's also why we're very proud to be partners with Lairdall that has a very similar mission statement with their helping save lives. 
Um, Eric has said in the intro that especially those of you who are here um, from medical schools, um, it's all about the competency-based or outcomes-based educational framework. The AAMC, as she mentioned, is working on kind of a new set of foundational competencies, but many of us are also, um, for the past decade or so, have been looking at um, aggregates of some of those foundational competencies in the professional tasks that we carry out every day, what are known as EPAs, Entrustable Professional Activities. And the AAMC has put forth this set of 13 core EPAs, which every medical student should be able to perform or demonstrate on day one of entering residency, no matter which specialty you're entering. For those of us uh, who are on the, the webinar who are not in the medical school um, arena, but maybe in nursing schools, physician assistant programs, and so forth, I'm, I know that you all have also analogous core competency frameworks. So I bring this up because any tool that you're going to, you know, may choose to use in your educational programs should be aligned with the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. Um, and so I will kind of use the EPAs here as the example. And although Harvey and the UMedic e-learning programs could satisfy several of these, what Harvey was first designed to be able to simulate was the bedside physical examination. That's those kind of clinical skills and the diagnostic reasoning that goes into taking the information we obtain from a good history and physical exam. Um, those first two EPAs are really the crux of what Harvey was, was designed for and what you could use him for in your programs. Just a little bit of history. Harvey's been around um, really longer than any of the computerized mannequins. Rissasi Ann from Lairdal um, predated Harvey uh, by a few years, but at that time, um, it was just an inert task trainer. Harvey was really one of the first and now the longest continuous of the computerized type of mannequins in health professions education. Made his debut in 1968 at the American Heart Association Scientific Meeting. Back then, one mannequin could only simulate one condition. And so Dr. Gordon had three different prototypes. You see them with different ages based on the uh, prevalence of disease in those different populations. Um, a number of years later, um, came up with a mannequin that could simulate multiple conditions in one. But you see, it was this gigantic, more than 500 pound piece of equipment with all kinds of moving pulleys and levers and rods that generated the pulses and so forth on the physical exam. It evolved over time in the 80s and 90s um, when really simulation was still in its infancy. Um, Harvey's grew to the point where we could simulate up to 27 different conditions, but it was still this very large um, device, as you can see, not very portable. Um, it pretty much stayed in one place. Um, then a big change happened. Harvey went on major diet. Um, in 2005, released this all digital version. All the pulses and movements were contained actually in the underbody of the mannequin. And it's just sitting atop this cabinet, which contained the computer system and the power systems for the mannequin. So much more portable, went from more than 500 pounds uh, to uh, about 90 pounds. Um, also could simulate at that time around 30 conditions, had the addition of some physical findings, um, like pulses in the arms, um, and the addition of breath sounds very importantly. And then a number of years ago, what we are calling Next Gen Harvey, you can recognize him by his cute little jumpsuit here, um, that now nearly doubled the number of conditions that Harvey could simulate up to 50, added again, some additional physical findings, like some additional peripheral pulses, um, and overall um, under the hood, had some significant um, hardware improvements. I'll show you toward the end of, of my remarks here, um, what are the latest developments in Harvey, although he looks essentially like this one now. Just to highlight what are some of the features that distinguishes Harvey. Again, many mannequins have heart sounds, lung sounds, um, peripheral pulses, um, but in Harvey, they're really about as realistic as you can get um, away from the human. So not only does he have, in terms of arterial pulses, bilateral carotids, 
brachial, radial, and femoral artery pulses. Um, in Harvey, it's not, is the pulse there or not? If it's not, I have to start defibrillating or, or doing CPR. Harvey, you don't do those emergency life-saving uh, procedures for. He always has a pulse when he's turned on, in fact. But these pulses can change in very subtle or nuanced ways, depending on which of those 50 conditions um, he's simulating. Also, unlike almost every other mannequin, Harvey also has jugular venous pulsations. And not only does he, does he have the presence of those, but you can see giant A waves, V waves, and so forth to really reinforce the underlying physiology and pathophysiology. Harvey also has chest wall movements, which no other mannequin really has. So the normal apex beat that you can feel in the, the left side of the chest under the normal condition, but also if he has chamber enlargement, say on the right side of the heart, you might get heaves or lifts, these movements of the chest wall over the sternum, or if he has a dilated ventricle because the heart has been volume overloaded for a period of time, then that may be displaced uh, infralaterally and enlarged. People automatically think of Harvey as like a heart sound simulator. And of course, he has just about every heart sound, murmur, gallop, click, rub that you can imagine. They can be heard in the classic four auscultatory areas here in the chest wall, but as would be appropriate, certain murmurs might radiate to the carotid arteries in the neck or out to the axilla, uh, depending on the origin of those heart sounds. And then Harvey also has lung sounds. Um, he has anterior, two different zones, upper and lower, and you can listen to the bases of the lungs kind of infralaterally. Very importantly, Harvey's heart sounds are all synchronized with the respiratory cycle. Um, so giving you really the most realistic possible findings, things like second sound splitting that happens when you breathe in or right-sided murmurs that might get louder when you inspire versus um, have exhalation. So besides these hyper-realistic um, physical findings that Harvey has, what other things set him apart? Well, as I mentioned, Harvey's not only one of the longest of the computerized type of mannequins, but he's still, to my knowledge, to this date, the only university-based simulation project. And I think that makes a big difference. Um, we are a center for research in medical education. And so over the years, Harvey has probably uh, become one of the most studied of, of the computerized mannequins. We've done multi-institutional outcome studies across different learner levels from, um, you know, beginning medical students, straight through all of medical school, into residency, even fellowship. And if we're look, talking about the nursing population, we also have that in uh, bachelor's prepared nurses versus advanced practice nurses. We've also studied Harvey and physician assistant populations. Um, and very importantly, not only do we show that um, they learn, is assessed in the simulation setting, but that the skills that they learn in simulation transfer to real patients. I have here the, the front page uh, of one article that appeared you know, more than 35 years ago in the Journal of Medical Education that documented that students that prepared in uh, with Harvey and the UMedic programs compared to traditionally trained students, that is catch as catch can in the clinics and in the hospital wards, um, they could better identify heart sounds and uh, physical exam findings in real patients with cardiac conditions. So very important to show that transfer uh, to the real clinical setting. This was at the undergraduate level. We've also shown that in the postgraduate level, for example, family medicine residents uh, did more efficient ordering of follow-on echocardiograms after training with Harvey versus traditional training. As a result, um, Harvey has been adopted really around the world. Um, more than 800 institutions have Harvey, more than 55 countries at this point. Uh, some of the kind of landmark achievements um, in Harvey's evolution, um, it was recognized by the British Heart Foundation, um, which is analogous to our American Heart Association in the UK, so much that they donated a Harvey to every medical school in, in the UK. At that time, this was in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, there were 27 medical student medical schools um, in that country, and they all got and implemented Harvey into their programs. 
Um, I've been focusing more on Harvey used for teaching and learning, um, but all, most simulators can also be used for assessment. And Harvey, in fact, has been used in very high stakes national um, examinations. The Royal College of Physicians of Canada used Harvey for more than a decade in their internal medicine oral board certification examination. Back on the teaching and learning side, Harvey can be adapted for use to accommodate all the different types of learning styles we know. Some students are very good learning in large groups, um, instructor-led lecture type of scenarios. Um, others learn better, more at kind of bedside rounds, if you will, still with the presence of an instructor, um, but with the learners kind of gathered around where they can all do hands-on. We do a lot of our training here actually without the presence of an instructor. About 75% of the time in a cardiology elective that we offer for fourth year medical students, um, they are working independently in small groups. And I'll talk in just a second about how we enable that uh, to be quite effective. And then some students prefer to kind of be on their own um, and working independently. Really, Harvey can be used in all of those. And we have done research that documents uh, effectiveness in all of those settings. Because Harvey comes from a university, we try to give you as much of the curricular materials that you can use with Harvey. After all, it is just a tool. Dr. Gordon recognized very early on um, that as important as the mannequin itself is the curriculum that it's integrated within. Um, so we provide a learner manual that summarizes all of the findings for these different conditions and tells the students how they can use Harvey on their own. We provide a very effective instructor guide that gleans from all of our decades long experience of teaching with Harvey, giving lots of little tips of the trade um, for how to be most effective incorporating Harvey into your curriculum. And very recently on the assessment side, um, we have also bundled some of the hybrid simulation cases that we used in our own end of clerkship OSCE here for many years. Um, we thought that those would be valuable tools for folks who would be using these in these objective structured clinical exams, OSCEs. Um, we do hybrid simulations um, where we have a standardized patient or simulated patient sitting right next to the mannequin. They give the history. They can do the interpersonal interactions. And in this uh, case manual that we provide, we give you the checklist for the history taking. We give the script for the SP. We give a checklist for the interpersonal skills assessment. And then of course, Harvey is programmed with physical findings that will go along with that history. So when the student does their physical exam, they turn to the mannequin and that's where they carry out their, their examination. Because obviously uh, SPs cannot fake a murmur or a distended neck veins or a displaced apex uh, if they don't happen to have those things. Again, Harvey comes with a complete curriculum. All 50 cases are fleshed out in a series of PowerPoint teaching slides. And these are case-based. We tell the students, this little wall chart here summarizes all the hundreds of different findings that you can find um, in Harvey. Um, we tell them, don't memorize one line because not every patient with, let's say, aortic stenosis as the diagnosis is going to have exactly these findings that are programmed in Harvey. They were chosen by a consortium of cardiologists, subject matter experts, to be exemplary to teach the salient features of that condition. So we always start with a history and interpose throughout this curriculum are questions uh, that we ask of our learners. And then the next slide would give them the answer. We spend a lot of time going over the physical findings. You can see questions and then answers. Auscultation, we give them little visuals, but of course they're meant to listen on the mannequin. And then how do you interpret those events? Here's a nice long explanation always again reinforcing the physiology or the pathophysiology. Dr. Gordon invented, as I alluded to early on, some of the very first e-learning programs. He recognized that computer-assisted instruction was really going to revolutionize the way we teach and the way our, our healthcare learners uh, learn the material. So what we call UMedic, get it, UM, it's even the school colors of the University of Miami here. Um, Go you. Uh, these are e-learning programs. They are now web accessible and they flesh out in a multimedia format those same um, teaching slides, if you will. So they'll again get the same case that's programmed in Harvey, 
Um, these can be used as standalone, however. They can they can supplement use with the mannequin or they can be used as standalone because in the multimedia version, they can watch a little video clip, they can hear the heart sounds and see that the stethoscope is placed at the lower sternal border, it looks like here. They can use this carotid pulsation for timing. And then it asks them a question. What do you think about this murmur? and they'll get immediate feedback. If they got it wrong, it explains why the wrong answer is not the best answer, and then goes into why the correct answer is. Um, so this was a case of aortic regurgitation, for example, and then we they get another little animation here that explains why is that a diastolic murmur, and why is it decrescendo? Well, it has to do with the pressure volume relationships in the ventricle and the aorta and so forth. Um, why is it best heard at the lower left sternal border? If this is aortic, that's normally the upper right. But they look at this little animation and they can see that that regurgitant jet is actually directed back into the heart. And that's why you hear it best at the lower left sternal border. This is a little animation, but we can also let them see what that would look like on ultrasound. Or if the person had a cardiac catheterization and they're doing a ventricular gram, they can actually see the injection of dye. So the amount of content in these e-learning programs is really an incredible asset, I think, to teaching programs. So those are some of the things that are already existing in Harvey. Where are we going? Um, just with some of the future Harvey developments. A little nod to Simex, which is going to speak at the end. Um, this is not quite ready for prime time, but we are looking at uh, VR and AR, augmented reality, additions to Harvey. So for example, instead of having a computer, which we have at Harvey's bedside, that's how the students are able to work independently. They don't need me there to teach every lesson. Dr. Gordon appears in a little video and they can use the e-learning programs to guide them through these lessons. Well, instead of needing a separate computer, maybe just looking through VR headsets, they can see those animations directly above Harvey or superimposed, they can actually visualize the underlying cardiac anatomy like they have x-ray vision. This isn't quite ready for prime time, as I said. One of the developments though that we wanted to feature in this webinar that is currently available um, is the different skin tones for Harvey. If you practice in any place like Miami, I know Ryan is out on the West Coast in, in the Bay Area. We have very diverse patient populations, very diverse learner groups, um, and for these more than 50 years now, Harvey has always been the white guy. Um, and um, we have now developed Harvey in diverse skin tones so that students, not only with their real patients that they're encountering, but in their simulated patients, um, they will have patients that look more like themselves and the patients that they're going to be encountering um, in their clinical practices. So. Um, with that, I'm, we, I know we're going to have questions and answers at the end, so I'm going to transition now to Errol, and I think that diversity and inclusion uh, topic is a good segue uh, to what she's going to talk to about um, in the next segment. Thank you very much. I will stop my screen share. Thanks, Dr. Scalise. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen real quick, and if you could just give me a quick thumbs up to make sure that uh, you all can see it, that would be fabulous. So two seconds. Oh no, I lost you guys. Can everyone see my screen A-OK? -okay? Yep, it's not full screen though. Yep. There, there we, we go. go. Full screen, beautiful, yep. OK. So good afternoon. Well, good morning for our folks on the West Coast. And thank you for attending. My name is Errol Garner. I am a Sim Capture Impact Manager here at Laredal for our South Central Region. Um, so special shout out to our people from the South Central Region that are here in attendance this afternoon. As an Impact Manager, my team and I work to maximize the usage of your Sim Capture platform to make sure that you get the most out of your system to increase teaching efficiency and better support for your learners. So if you have some capture and you're unaware of who your impact manager might be or not sure what their contact information is, feel free to drop a question um, in the question to answer box and we'll be sure to get someone out to you to make sure they answer that for you. So for our folks that do not have SIM capture, what is it? What does it do and can anyone use it? So it is a scalable platform for managing simulation center 
simulation centers to record, debrief, assess OSCEs, other high stakes examinations, as well as simulations. It's designed specifically for healthcare education, and it is a 100% web-based solution, which means you do not have to be within your simulation center or training site to utilize this platform. The system is built to streamline, automate, and manage OSCEs, again, leaning more so towards our medical professionals, I know we have others here, and team-based simulations, while simultaneously tracking our performance um, and simulation center usage. Today, I'm going to chat a little bit about a tool within SimCapture that can be used to support training your standardized patients or SPs on implicit bias. But before we do that, I have a couple of polling questions that I would love for you all to answer so I can get a gauge of what everybody's feeling this afternoon. So the first question that I have for you is, do you currently have an implicit bias training within your SP or standardized patient program? This can include onboarding or your refreshers. Yes, no, or considering it for a future reference. And I'll give you a couple seconds for that. Let's see. Oh, wow. So we've got a, around about 52% of folks that no, they do not currently have a training, um, but we do have a roughly 32% that are considering it for the future. Um, and about 16% of people said yes. So the next question that I have for you, for the folks that said yes, um, which examples of implicit bias do you see within your simulation center? Feel free to check all that apply. There's no one answer. Um, so age, body habitus, gender, gender expression, race and ethnicity, religion, spirituality, and socioeconomic status. Seems to be a general rough consistent with age um, as well as socioeconomic status. I think the big one um, that I was expecting probably to see higher was probably for body habitus when you're dealing with standardized patients in your simulation center. Um, but cool, this is beautiful. Just wanted to get a rough idea of what everyone was doing. Um, but since we're going to chat about it, let's dive a little bit deeper into what exactly implicit bias is. It's a form of bias that occurs automatically and unintentionally that nevertheless, it will affect your judgments, decisions, and behaviors. It's a widely held, simplified, essential, essentialist beliefs about a special group, specific group, I'm sorry. So it can be, again, race and ethnicity, your language, your socioeconomic status, so on and so forth, as well as a prejudgment of a person based on a group with which he, she, or they are associated with, as well as um, oversimplified images or ideas. And I know the general idea that's probably crossing your mind right now is how in the world is SimCapture going to tie into training my standardized patients for um, implicit bias? Well, SimCapture has a feature that allows you to pull an iterator consistency report, which is what you can see here on your screen now. The report provides a visual so that you can see the agreement between subjective ratings by multiple raters. With this report, you will be able to export a combination of multiple organizations. And when I say organizations, think of cohorts or pods or however you would like to group your participants or students or learners. Um, courses, which is what we're currently taking a peek at at the moment. Scenarios, can everyone see my purple pointer okay? Beautiful. Scenarios, think along the sense of what's on your syllabus. Your courses, your syllabus, your scenarios are what goes into your syllabus. So things that you are addressing at a much more micro level, as well as your evaluations that you can gather data from. So how could this be useful? This tool can be used when assessing your standardized patients to see if any additional training is needed, as well as to see if the practice of standardization is happening amongst your SPs as well as with your faculty. So if we just wanna take a quick peek at this, I know the first thing that catches everyone's eye are the colors. And the first thing that you think is red equals bad and green equals great, almost um, putting it in the same category. It's like when you go to a stoplight, red means stop, green means go, let's keep moving. And in this situation, that's not necessarily what it means. It's to alert you of what's going on. Um, if we could just kind of take a peek at Henry Williams as well as Neil Peters. Henry has a row with a negative two, a negative 1.2, and a negative 2.1 for an overall. And Neil has a two and another two, but he, his overall score still was below around the average for the standard deviation here. 
So the purpose of the colors are to show when the colors are much darker, that means you are much higher than your standard deviation for that's been set for the um, evaluation that's taking place. If it's a lighter color, that means it is one standard deviation above or below the means that's taking place. So as you can see, it's a possibility with Henry interacting with 11 students or participants or learners, um, because again, everyone is a learner. Um, it's a possibility that maybe it was a rough day with grading or maybe on the opposite side of the spectrum, Henry thought it was a great day to test out his Broadway acting skills and just go above and beyond. And the students were thoroughly confused and was just like, wait a second, I don't really recall reading that on the patient history. On the flip side of things, let's take a peek at Neil. It's a possibility that Neil had a group that was just knocking it out of the park, left and right, no big deal, and they were just rocking it. On the flip side of things, it's a possibility that Neil could have been a standardized patient that laid in the bed and just read straight off the script, and the students were just like, all right, we got it. We just came in and took over, and we can just keep moving forward. But taking a peek at this, you can have a general idea of how to address things with your standardized patients and seeing if there's addressed, uh, things that need to be addressed. So the next thing that comes to mind when you're looking at this would be how often are they encountering certain students or how often are they interacting with certain students that we have or participants, which leads me to our encounters report. So this report shows the interaction of the participants versus your evaluators. So as you can see, we've got Neil and Henry up here at the top. So how, again, would this be helpful with the report that we just saw? With this report, administrators or your faculty can view this color-coded downloadable OSCE encounter report that shows which standardized patients have seen which learners and when takes place for the next encounter to make sure that these learners do not encounter the same standardized patient every time. So it's a possibility that, let's see, did Neil encounter any of the same patients that Henry had? We've got an overlap here with the student, but that doesn't necessarily mean um, that Henry was grading extra hard or that Neil was grading extra hard. This is just information for you then to take back to work with your standardized patients to say, hey, let's do a quick run through of this to see if we're using the same type of communication, the same verbiage, the same language, the same body mannerisms when you're interacting with your students. So we've discussed what it looks like to pull the information to see what your standardized patients are standing with their evaluations or grading, as you could say, what the encounters look like. Now, what does it look like once we have both of that information on how we can support um, your standardized patient program with remediating um, implicit bias, excuse me, with SIM capture? So the first thing that comes up is recording a follow-up session. You would love to do this because then you can capture the feedback between your student as well as with your standardized patient. In this moment, you can make sure that your verbiage is standardized and being able to identify habits and you can correct them immediately. The next thing is an SP or standardized patient education program that can include an onboarding training as well as a continuous education program throughout their SP career with your site or within your institution. Because I know sometimes standardized patients kind of float around with programs, not just with med, they might be with nursing or physical therapy or whatever the case may be. The next one, my personal favorite, is the dress rehearsal or the dry run for your OSCEs or high stakes exams that's taking place. This then gives your standardized patients to run the same simulation that's taking place and recording and debriefing, but they do not have the participant or learner in front of them. This gives them the opportunity to do everything that they normally would. So let's say Neil was using his opportunity to act like he was on Broadway then. We can now bring this in and have a conversation about it and say, hey, you know, just a quick step back, we love what you're doing, but it's just a little much for the students. The second, the last thing that we have is for a safe environment. I do apologize if you can hear my dog in the background. Um, for a safe environment, it allows for the creation for the trainees to feel comfortable and safe when they're doing and participating in simulations. But one of the big factors of all of this is it creates a very beneficial learning experience for your students and something that they will take along with them throughout the program. So I know that we have discussed remediating, we have discussed what it looks like for pulling the reports, well, seeing the reports for your encounters, as well as what it looks like for taking a peek at, uh, across for all of your standardized patients and what they're doing for evaluating. And one of the big topics of discussion is research. What is being done for impl implicit bias training in medicine right now? So my teammates and I have come across a few articles and journals that we have listed here that others have written to show how and what they're doing to combat this. So they're doing everything from developing or redefining their training programs, working with legislation to create programs for continuing education, as well as we have a list of 
extensive bias training bills that are being urged from various states across the country for a resolution for this issue that's taking place. So with STEM Capture, if you're interested in moving forward with doing research, whether it's with implicit bias or something else, STEM Capture can definitely assist with your research projects due to the reports that you can pull from the platform. Um, you can pull things such as the recorded hours that take place, course scores. So the course that we looked at earlier, you can break that down to each individual scenario itself for data, as well as various reports that you can utilize for showing usage within your center. Um, so that is SIM Capture for you all. Now, I do would like to say if you have any questions or comments um, regarding SIM Capture, if you're interested in learning inf more information about it, or if you're wanting to learn more about your impact manager and what that looks like, or if you're just sure, surely curious to read some of the articles that we have here, please do so in the question and answer box. And I will definitely make sure between myself and teammates of impact managers that we assist you with your time. And now I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Ryan Rivera and he's gonna chat with us a little bit about SNMX. All right, thanks so much. I will go ahead and share my screen here. Um, so, there we go. So grateful for the opportunity we have to talk to you today about SimX. Fundamentally, what we are trying to do is use VR to make simulation training cheaper, easier, and more realistic. Though ultimately, like I think some of the other speakers have mentioned, it is about this. It is about saving lives. It's about reducing the huge number of preventable deaths that occur every year in our healthcare system. And that's actually, I'm, I'm an emergency medicine doc and assistant professor out at Stanford. I worked for CMS, AHRQ, and the American Medical Association prior to founding CIMEX. And so, uh, you know, going through those types of means as regulatory and public health efforts, um, you know, that's important work. But eventually, I realized that you know, with programs like that, you're very lucky to make like a three, four, five percent uh, dent in preventable deaths in, within like a certain subset. And what we really need is like an 80 percent decrease of this whole pie. Um, that's where we got interested in SIM and looked to the airline industry as an example. After all, that's how they became so safe, or at least that's one part of it is through high volume of high quality SIM. And, um, you know, looking then at the healthcare industry and the simulation that we performed, you know, I think there's some gaps. And we're all familiar, of course, with mannequin technologies. It's, it's great. Um, it works well. I use mannequins when training my residents uh, at Stanford. I was trained on them myself. But we know there's a few things that they tend to struggle with. In particular, I think things like stroke-like symptoms, traumatic injuries, rashes, or kind of the psychosocial family dynamic aspects of medicine. And th those are really important, right? Those are um, a key part of being a physician or a nurse or an EMT is being able to manage some of that psychosocial complexity or, or environmental complexity as well. You know, again, speaking of field providers, um, I mean, it's, it's really tricky to navigate a dangerous environment prior to providing care. And that's really hard to reproduce with traditional simulation technologies. So that's one of the areas where VR shines, I think, is that, you know, in the patient uh, physiology, you can represent anything. They can be vomiting, they can be missing limbs. Uh, demographically, uh, your patient can be a baby or a grandmother. Um, and, you know, environmentally, there's so many options, as you can see, kind of through these samples of just some of the scenarios that we offer, you can be you know, in an inpatient room and then snap your fingers and you're in the ED and then snap your fingers and you're in the back of the ambulance. Um, and then, you know, the fact that you can do this in a package that you can set up anywhere in less than five minutes. This is an example of the Air Force using this, and they've set it up just in a hangar. And they've got one team that's doing a mass casualty, one that's in the back of a transport helicopter, and one that's pulling somebody out of a burning Humvee. And so we're hopeful that with this technology, we can achieve those twin goals of being able to do SIM more often and to have that SIM be more realistic. Um, therefore allowing us to improve that patient outcomes. And, you know, there's some evidence that that is happening. So um, VR is still relatively new, but it's been out long enough that we have things like meta-analyses of studies looking at the efficacy of VR compared to other simulation modalities. And generally speaking, it holds up very well um, in terms of learning retention and the translation of those skills also into actual practice environments. Um, now, telling you a little bit more about the background of, of Simex as a company. So we actually started way back in 2013. This is a quick little video of us on the main stage at TechCrunch in, in 2014, 
presenting what I believe is the first public presentation of any type of XR technology for medical training. And, uh, you know, uh, please don't laugh too hard at the graphics or the fact that they're jittering there on the bed. This is early stage technology. It's come a long way since then. Um, but that's back when we filed our uh, initial patents uh, around this space. And uh, since then have grown quite a bit across the country and across the world. We now have um, over 100 customers in the civilian space in the U.S. We're over in over 30 countries. We have nine of the top 15 hospitals in America that are adopting this. So VR really has broken into the mainstream in a big way. And, you know, the way that we've built this technology is based around, you know, traditional principles in medical education. We're not just a bunch of computer programmers who thought it would be cool to go into healthcare, right? I and mean, we're coming from a background of medical education. And so um, the software operates as like a series of states. And this probably looks familiar if you've authored cases for implementation with mannequins. Um, with critical actions at each stage and your patient's physiology and vital signs and such will adapt based on the decisions you make. If you choose the right, you know, critical actions will go down the good path. If you make mistakes, go down the bad path. And it can really branch out into very complex scenarios from there um, because you as the human moderator don't have to uh, monitor every aspect of this scenario like you do when using traditional simulation met methodologies. The software is monitoring that and doing a lot of that work for you. But you do have a lot of power as the instructor to modify the scenario as it goes along, make it harder or easier for your trainees, really keep them in that sweet spot where you're challenging them just enough that they're learning, but not so much that they're freaking out and they're going to go home crying at the end of the day. Um, you have that ability with uh, the tools that we give you through our instructor module, and we'll actually show that to you in just a minute. And then, of course, you know, we all know the debrief is just as important as the sim, if not more so. And so we provide you with some powerful tools for facilitating that. Um, reports that tell you which critical actions were done and not done, timestamps of literally everything that happened in this scenario. So it's very easy for you as the instructor to say, you know, hey, you, you didn't put them on the monitor until five minutes in and they were attacking away at 170 the whole time. And you don't have to keep track of that while you're going through. We also let you record the scenarios in their entirety so that you can play them back, scan through, and replay key moments for learning purposes. And, you know, we've been doing this a long time. And so from a content perspective, uh, we have a pretty expansive catalog that addresses training for nurses, physicians, EMS personnel, and others. About 270 scenarios you could peruse right now if you'd like to on our marketplace, um, covering a wide variety, variety of topics, including you know, just like med surge, emergency department, acute care kind of stuff, but also um, psychiatry, end of life care, OB scenarios where you're taking care of both the mother and the baby um, and a wide variety of, you know, mass casualty and community medicine cases as well. Let's hop into the demo actually. So I've got Dr. Tyler Andre with me, who's going to be moderating a scenario. I'll stop my screen share so he can pop in. Um, and with him, actually, he's going to be moderating the scenario from uh, Washington State. Um, he will have Dr. Nilesh Patel, who is in Ohio at the moment, and Tyler Andre, who is an emergency medicine PA uh, located in Salt Lake City, joining remotely. And I'll kind of tell you a little bit about some of the features as we watch this scenario unfold. Okay, here we go. Can you see my screen? Yes. Looks good. Uh, Tanner and Nilesh, can you guys say something? I want to make sure your audio is coming through. Yep. Hey, uh, this is Nilesh Patel and, uh, with the green hands. I'm Tanner. All right. Awesome. All right. I'm going to go on mute and I'll let Ryan kind of narrate as we go through this. Okay. So we'll watch them kind of navigate this scenario. And what we're seeing here is the instructor interface that Tyler is using as the case moderator. Now, one thing you can see is that here in the bottom right, we can easily see into the VR world. That's something that's relatively unique to our product. Um, you don't have to be wearing a headset to control and understand what's happening in the VR space. Tyler can also switch around between the first person perspectives of the participants um, so that we can easily see what's happening. Uh, Tyler, actually, you might want to unmute yourself so we can hear some of the, the audio from the participants. Yeah, let, I'm just trying to figure out how to hide the uh, bar at the top. <laughs> hide floating oh, media fine. controls. There we go. Found it. All right, um, I'm gonna go first Thanks. person view from Tanner here. There you go, and kind of see him here. I can click over to my dialogue tabs. They just asked what was going on, and so I can kind of click through some of this pre-recorded audio. Uh, 
I was playing soccer and then the other kids said I passed out. Okay, has anything like that happened before? Um, and then you can, I can choose what I want to answer, right? No. I can also tap over to the mother here. She can introduce herself. Hi, I'm Maria. Oh, what, what happened today? He was fine when he left for school this morning. I don't okay. really know well, what I understand. happened. I just woke up on the ground. Okay, and we're going to speed this up. He uh, EMS already gave their sign out and let us know that he had uh, syncopized. Um, I'm going to advance and make his condition a little bit worse by going to the site map over here. And he can go yeah. into VTAC. Okay. Yeah, I'll start I feel really okay. dizzy again. Look at the leads on him as well. Yeah. Okay. It looks so like... Now we can see on the monitor, it looks like he's in VTAC. Okay. I feel for a pulse. He doesn't look very good. Or the back down. Okay. I'm not feeling a pulse. Let's start CPR. Can you start CPR, please? <laughs> Do we okay. have um, CPR? Has a yeah. wide variety of scenarios, including right. a so number of ACLS, on PALS, ATLS, and true like mega code scenarios. So you know, this one, we've got two providers put together in the scenario. They've got virtual yeah. nurses who are assisting them. We can also run this scenario with a provider, with nurses, with respiratory therapy, uh, standing at the head of the bed. So everyone working together as a team around this VR scenario. Right now. What's unique to our platform is that, um, and I'm going to take the volume down just a little bit on that in. case. I'm going to get the defibrillator ready. It is coming through loud and clear there. Um, just one like of the things here. that's relatively unique to our platform is that, as you can see here, they can work together from different okay, parts of the country, pressure. but you can Better also left. be, just, you can also be in the for just a sec, Ryan's going to, uh, tell a little bit about it. I can't get my control screen back. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. They, they can also be in the same space at the same time, working around the same virtual patient and everything is lined up. So if you high five in VR, you'll high five in real life. There's a couple of things that you have already seen in this scenario. Um, they were able to just kind of talk to the patient like they would normally talk to them. Um, there's no drop down menus for the users to navigate from their perspective. They're interacting just as they would in real life. Um, and we have over 450 functioning tools within the Simex platform. So you see there defibrillators, patient monitors. Um, they can intubate in this scenario. They have every single code med that they would usually have. They even have a functioning EMR system that you saw them briefly navigating there earlier that updates as they go along. They can even place orders from that touchscreen based uh, EMR while they're in the VR sim and have those show up and be pulled in the Pixis just so you, so you can follow the same workflow as you would follow in real life. This is a PED scenario, so. Um... I'm gonna quickly load into a second scenario just to show you uh, one of our more modifiable recent products called the Virtual Mannequin. Uh, to answer the question in the chat, yes, those were two NPCs in the scenario. Um, the level of control the moderator has depends on the case, uh, but yes, Tyler was the one um, as the instructor who is able to provide responses for the NPCs, decide what they are going to do in terms of getting meds, um, doing chest compressions, that sort of thing. So a couple of unique things as this loads. This scenario is uh, called the virtual mannequin and it allows the instructor to on the fly, kind of in manual mode, um, to use a, a Lairdall phrase, uh, adjust things as uh, at will, right? This this allows you to build thousands of different scenarios all in one. And so we can see that we've got our two learners here. I can go through these different presets that have been built, as well as being able to, as they place Mary Todd here on the monitor, um, go ahead and change her. Let me go to first person view. Um, of Tanner over there in red, I can go to the cardiac waveform that's on the monitor. And uh, Tanner, if you look at the monitor, I can go ahead and we'll just put them right into VFib. Or let's go into VTAC. All right. So if, if for whatever reason, you know, the 270 scenarios in the marketplace don't kind of suit your needs in terms of what um, you would like to run your trainees through, you can use these, what we call the virtual mannequin series, 
to be able to basically on the fly no, design no, scenarios no. yourself and run people yeah, through them. Right um, here. So it gives you a ton of Look, breadth in terms of what you can portray with the heart, with but also the lungs as well. So and not all chest pain comes from the heart. Let's look for the new thorax, make sure the lungs are sliding appropriately. You can even do an e-fast exam. Look at all those windows as well. Let's make the patient hold their chest in some pain here. Now, uh, Tyler, let's stop that screen share. I'll go back to the slides, show one more thing, and then we'll move to the Q&A. Sounds great. Right. So, and I'll show this in answer to the kind of question here in the chat. What is the value other than the ability to train remotely? So I would say, actually, the biggest value is not training remotely. The biggest value is the fact that you can, um, you know, within five minutes in any empty room with headsets that cost you 400 bucks, pull up an entire sim center. Right. So this is a good example that I've I've shown you here. This is uh, one of our uh, customers, Children's National. They use this for complicated cardiac critical care scenarios. Um, could you do this in real life? Yes. Uh, or with traditional sim, you would need a baby mannequin, all of the NICU equipment. You would need a functioning ventilator. You would need a functioning transcutaneous pacemaker. You would need all the syringe pumps. You would need the Pixis machine. You'd need the actors to play the parents and the sim center time. Um, that's the type of sim you can only do once or twice a year. But with VR, they just get an empty classroom and they pop that up in five minutes and they can do that 10 times a day or every single day if they would like. So I think that is truly the, the value add there is the ability to really incorporate SIM into every aspect of your curriculum because of the ease in which you can get it up and going. So I know there are probably a lot of other questions out there. So I think we'll close out there. Hopefully they give you a good sense of what we offer. Feel free to check out the website at SIMXVR dot com for more information um, and I will turn the time back over. Great. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate each one of your presentations. Um, I'm not sure if uh, everybody's seen this, but there's lots of questions coming in in the Q&A box. Um, some of them have been answered, but just so everybody can kind of hear the answers to some of these questions, I'll, I'll read some of these aloud. Um, maybe we'll start with a, a Harvey question first. So someone's asking if you can actually mic Harvey or if, if vo uh, voice can come out of him. Yeah, so if you might have noticed when I had that, those panels that showed the different features that were present, it did have a voice that you could speak for Harvey. That actually is going to be going away um, with the, the newest ones that come out with the new skins. And that's chiefly because we found that that was probably the least utilized feature. Um, that's great for just straight fact gathering, right? So you walk in and somebody could tell you, when did the chest pain start? How long does it last? What makes it better? What makes it worse? But for the interpersonal skills part of it, which is what it seems like most programs are interested in doing, um, the history taking, the fact gathering along with the interpersonal, then a static mannequin doesn't make as much sense. And that's why we use the hybrid simulation where we sit an SP right next to the mannequin. So the mannequin can give the physical findings that the SP can't mimic. Um, but the SP can obviously emote and interact in a humanistic way uh, that a mannequin can't. So that's a feature that we had had in Harvey up until now. That's going to be going away um, as we roll out the Harveys with the new skins. Great. Um, this next one is for SimX. The, uh, someone's asking, are there any uh, SimX designs uh, made to run on their own without a moderator? Yes, uh, so we do have a number of scenarios that you can just pop on a headset and run through, in particular ones that are more about procedural training, how to put in a transvenous pacemaker um, is a popular one. We have um, one for pericardiocentesis that is the same. We also have nursing procedures as well for those in the audience who also train nurses. Um, we, we tend to have moderator controls for those that are more psychosocial that um, are more involved environmentally just because we find from a realism perspective, it's helpful to have the moderator engaged, but we definitely have some where that's not needed. And then, I don't know if you can share your screen, but they were at, someone was asking if they could see the slide with the headset on it. Um, and I know that SimX can be used with the Meta, the Pico, as well as the HTC Vive headsets. Yeah. But let me, um, let me show you that. So, and uh, good eyes for that person because I did I did kind of skip through that real quick. But we are compatible with all major brand wireless headsets. 
So Oculus One, if you can find one, but uh, Oculus Quest Two and Three, which are their newer models, the HTC Focus Series, the Pico Neo. Um, so ba basically all of the major brand wireless headsets. Great. Um, the next question is for you, Errol, around the inter-reader reliability. Um, they're asking how they can set up the inter-reader reliability comp evaluation tool using the evaluation of regular group simulations. So for example, pre-built cases. Can it be used with external checklists or assessment forms? So when you're creating things within Sim Capture, when we're using external checklists and things of that nature, I always will voice and push that put in as much as you can when you're trying to track data um, within Sim Capture because it's hard to do when it's something in a whole different platform and you're trying to come back and pull reports from it. Um, but you can definitely use uh, evaluations and checklists focusing on certain question categories um, within Sim Capture to utilize. Um, if this is someone that's a current SIM capture user, I would love to schedule time to show them what this looks like um, in the platform for your inter-rater reliability. But yes, you can bring in checklists from outside sources that you use and put them into your SIM capture platform to track for data. Um, it's a little bit impossible to do if you're doing you know, your assessments elsewhere. So again, put as much as you can within your SIM capture platform. So that way in the long run, when you're coming to pull data from it, you have everything right there at your fingertips. Great. Um, one about Umedic. They're asking if it's a subscription or capital purchase. That's a great question. Thanks. Actually, different than, than most e-learning programs right now, it is an institutional site license. So it's a one-time purchase, um, unlimited numbers of users and no time expiration on that. Um, if you're using it mostly for what I call the front end, the history and physical part of the cases, um, and even the EKG and, and so forth, because uh, the UMedics present an EKG, a chest X-ray, an echo for all of those patients. Um, that really doesn't change over time. There's a whole treatment section, though, that is part of each of the UMedic programs, and that obviously changes. Our consortium updates those every three or four years. And then we just send out a notice to folks, hey, an update of UMedic is available. Um, and you know, some folks decide that they do want to upgrade to that. That's usually if you're using that more in the clinical phase of training or with postgraduate trainees and things like that. But institutional site license, um, not a subscription. Okay, great. So we are just about at the top of the hour. I just wanted to thank all of our presenters one more time. I really appreciate learning more about Harvey, Sim Capture, and SimX. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees. As a reminder, you will be receiving a recording of this uh, via email in the next couple of days. And any questions that were not answered um, from the Q&A box, I will uh, meet up with the presenters following this to, to get the answers and we'll email them out to you. So again, thank you for your day and we appreciate your time.